Good evening, and welcome to Gaming Ballistics Firing Squad. Today we are joined by John Lammers, the primary content creator for the virtual tabletop Epic Table. Uh, John, thanks for joining me this evening. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great. This is a part of a bit of a continuing series of interviews regarding virtual tabletops and online gaming for the role-playing game blog association March Blog Carnival, and that needs a much shorter name, um, which is involved, oddly enough, in virtual tabletops and online gaming. <laughs> so I wanted to uh, start by asking you a couple of questions. Um, obviously, since this is an interview, it would not make sense for me to just talk. Um, so what led you to develop a new virtual tabletop? Uh, well, actually, it, it started back when my friends and I were having a reunion game. It was a, a face-to-face group that I had gained with for many years, and we'd all kind of drifted apart, gone to live in different states. And um, and this was a while ago. So um, at the time, I wasn't aware of, of other virtual tabletops out there. There may have been some. I became aware of them, you know, sh- um, I guess shortly after I had started the effort. Um, but really, I was just looking for a way to play. And, uh, you know, we had tried playing over Skype, and, and we just didn't really have the, the tool set that we needed. And so I started to develop Epic Table, um, and then I started to see some of the other virtual tabletops um, pop up. And um, there were just things that I wanted to do differently. Um, things that I wanted to focus on with Epic Table that weren't really the focus of the the things that I was seeing out there in the marketplace. So with that in mind, so two sort of two questions, one somewhat personal and, and one more uh, um, uh, directed at, at your development efforts. So what led you to say, are you, a, are you clearly you're a software developer? Did you become a software developer? Is that something that you've just been doing or... No, I had been a software developer for years, and that's what I do professionally. Um, and I had always worked on like little side projects and things like that. And you know, it was the kind of thing where any project I would get going on for for a, a weekend or two, and then it would you know it dawn on me that gee, you know, to I I can't really do something like this in my spare time. Um, you know, it's not something that just takes a couple weekends, and you know. So I had all this this series of kind of failed uh, personal projects, um, you know, due to lack of time because I had a day job that I liked and and that kind of thing, and um, and then one day, you know, I was uh, I was messing around with the epic table idea, and and I found that. I had been playing World of Warcraft at the time, <laughs> and I was like, you know what? I just I have proof here that I have time to do something else. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I canceled my World of Warcraft account and started Epic Table. No, nothing says I have time like uh, either XCOM, Enemy Unknown, or one of the innumerable multi-MMOs uh, out there, huh? Right, right. Um, so, yeah, so, what, okay, so quick. Epic Table. How did you come up with the name? Um, so Epic Table started out as this this horribly named thing, um, VXP Roleplay, which was like a um, virtual experience roleplay, and it was just it was almost embarrassing to say anytime I would talk to my friends about it. And you know, so I was I was really looking for something that was that was better, and um, and I start had started to look along lines of. Um, terminology from from the games that I was playing and you know right about that time the I think that the the three five set was coming out with their their epic uh, rule book ah, and, sure. and I was like yeah you know that 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 kind of works okay um, so uh, going right into the the game part of it so in general what do you think are the best and worst features of, of a VTT so if you're designing a virtual tabletop what are the things you want to avoid? What are the things that you want to provide? Uh, well, you know, it's hard to say in a way because the the VTTs that are out there, they all have different focuses, and um, you know, and obviously there's there are, are things that that I see as important um, that you know, and things that I've consciously stayed away from, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's that. It, is something that you must stay away from, or something that isn't good for some of the people out there. Um, so the my 
my favorite example is rules automation. Epic Table doesn't do rules automation. Um, there are there are dice rolls that you can define, and there's a, a dice roll builder. Uh, but that's that's about as far as it goes. It doesn't do um, doesn't try to automate the rules for you. And depending on who you are, that's a strength or a weakness. Um, to me, it's a weak it's a it's a strength because I play a lot of different games, and even the games that are like really mainstream, like Pathfinder or D and D, um, we use a lot of house rules. Um, my players are kind of always going off the rails, so uh, so I, I don't what really rails? what. <laughs> Surely there aren't rails in a role playing game. Right. You know, I I actually found that I I had started out wanting to do rules automation. I had like been experimenting with this thing I called CoGM, and and it was all based around rules automation. And what I found was it was just it was I didn't have a lot of time to prep, and. When I wasn't prepped, or even if I had prepped and my car- my players went and did something else, the the rules automation was getting in my way. I was like, I need to stat up this thing, and oh, I, I, I can't quite do that on the fly because I haven't had time to, to develop a custom uh, feat for this thing that I want to use, or, you, you know, or I can't get him in the, the tool without defining some minimum set of things, it just made it really hard to wing it. And so um, so one of the core values of Epic Table is that they're, it's completely prepless. Um, you can do stuff ahead of time, but the presumption is that you're going to be pulling things in dynamically and um, – you know, and you're going to be the guy running the rules. It's not trying to replace the the GM. It's replacing the table and the stuff on the table. Right, right. No, and I think it's it's funny because I was actually just uh, you probably saw me looking off to the to my second monitor. I was looking for a ninety some odd message thread that I've had. I'm trying to start my own game. Um, you know, that shouldn't necessarily be hard, but you know, it's great. You got to set the ground rules, and I've got some cork players yeah. that are going to join me. Um, and I'm have written some rules. Um, in Pyramid Magazine, I have a grappling book out. And I'm like, okay, so I want to play this game. My God, I've just spent the last five years rewriting GURPS in various <laughs> ways. So which of this huge list of, well, not here, right, not here, Sean Punch has a huge list of contributions. I have a small list, a handful. But almost everything that I've written has been rules. It's, it's you know, here's a grappling rule, here's a rule for breaking swords, here's a new rule for aiming differently, here's what are the, uh, a different rule for doing dodging. Uh, I did a whole rewrite of a fatigue system. And I was like, wow, I, I, I have so many of these that I'm no longer playing the game as written, and I really need to do less. Um, and so, you know, I've started eliminating some of my own stuff. Not because any one of them is a bad idea, but because all of them together are dear God in heaven. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, right. And, and but it's a, and really, you know, that's that's not necessarily a story about me. That's more like okay, so let's say that someone wanted to come up with GURPS rules support or Pathfinder rules support, but then you're like, well, yes, but I don't like the way that dexterity is only for ranged weapons. I want dex to apply to all hit, and I want strength to apply to all damage. Right. Well, now you have coding to do. So I hope you're a scripter or that it's easy, or that the developer, yourself in this case, anticipated your rules needs. Right, right. So yeah, I can, I, and, yeah, go ahead, please. It, you know, I'm a developer, and I don't want to spend my time doing that kind of right. stuff. You know, it's, um, and and I'm, we're, my group is almost always playing off the books to some extent. You know, there's always, there's always some custom weirdness going on. And, uh, yeah, it. Right. Right, and in, and in a way, I suppose, if, uh, if I understand it at all, uh, the less rule support you build into a virtual tabletop, the better you support the old school renaissance. Yeah, I think that that's true to a certain extent. Um, you know, basically that if you can do it at the table, you can do it in the, the virtual environment if it's, if it's one that has that philosophy. Mm-hmm. So tell me a little bit about what your mission statement mentally, uh, if you ever wrote it down, great. If not, I don't care. Uh, what your mission statement was for Epic Table. What were you trying to do? It sounds like you know you just wanted to recreate what you were, what your your tabletop experience on the computer. But you probably had a list of features that you really wanted to have. So what what drove you? Yeah. So um, basically, I wanted to be the Apple of virtual tabletops. 
um, you know, or the iPod of virtual tabletops. I wanted the um, I wanted something that anybody could use that was um, that was polished and easy. Um, you know, so there's a lot of things in Epic Table that aren't features because they're not. Uh, they're not ready to be exposed to people yet. Like I occasionally get asked about chat logs. Um, all the text chat in Epic Table actually is saved in a log, um, but it's not. Um, it's not. It's just not ready for for publication to the user. Um, it's not a. It's not a done feature. And one of the core values of Epic Table is that it's not a. It's not a hacker's platform. It's not. You know, not a DIY kind of thing. Um, it's a it's a finished tool. So, um, so that means that 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 feature is not available yet. Um, will be at some point, but it's it's not yet. But you know, what you get in return for kind of that reticence to release stuff is things like you don't. Um, you know, it was really core to me that you never. Write XML. You never write scripts. You never um, have to place files in certain directories. That kind of thing. You know, it was all about. Um, so you, someone should be able to sit down with this, who's not a developer, doesn't want to be a developer, um, and doesn't want to spend a lot of time learning the tool, and just work with it. Sounds like you've written it for the old over forty set. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, maybe. Um, I'm being self-referential. I'm I'm 42 years old. I have a kid. My time is incredibly limited. You know, a lot of it's spent on Trans-Pacific conference calls for work. So when I'm gonna do gaming, I want to sit down. I want to boot something up. I want it to work. I want to not mess with it. If I pull in a map, great. And I want to be able to go click, click, click. Here's a bunch of characters or whatever, and rock it because don't have time for the rest of it. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I I just didn't want any any conversations like, how do I configure my router? Oh, what's a router? Um, you know, how do here take these files and put them here and then restart? You know, that kind of stuff. Um, just wanted to make sure that that wasn't part of the experience. So that that was part of it. Um, and initially, actually, uh, fog of war was a huge thing for me. I thought. Um, I thought that fog of war was going to be a huge, huge deal, and I spent a lot of time back in 2006 uh, writing this ray trace based fog of war, and and you know part of my mission was you know part one was be the the iPod of VTTs, but part two was and have the best fog of war out there, and um, what I found in the course of developing. Fog of War was really two things. There were a lot of things I had to have before I had Fog of War to make the game a, uh, you know, to make the environment really usable. And um, part two was in the the course of doing it, I realized that I didn't really want Fog of War in the same way that I thought I did. Um, you know, I thought that I wanted something kind of hyper realistic, and and what I found was that doing that took it put a certain tax on the machine um, itself in terms of horsepower, but it also it took a lot of t my time. I had to prep the maps, and and at one t point I remember I had, I was spending a lot of time on trying to optimize the 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 process for marking up a map, and um, and even planned this series of videos where I was going to have um, you know a timer in the corner and show how quick it was to mark up a given map, and. Uh, Sort of you know, it's just become your own worst enemy. Yeah, yeah. It just dawned on me that this isn't really what I want to do as a um, as a, a guy running the game, and so that's that's where you know just most recently in Epic Table One that two I released my sort of revamped concept of Fog of War that's based around this concept of zones, and and it's really really ultra simple, um, almost embarrassingly so, but. But you know, you basically just draw zones on the on the map and hide and reveal them. Right. Um, so it, you know, in, in some ways, it it almost harkens back to you know the way you used to throw a piece of uh, construction paper over part of your map at the table, or you know, throw a, a cloth over part of the map at the table. Um, but you know, it has the advantage of the zones 
stick in place and you can flip them on and off like a light switch and and it uh, the nice thing is that you know when my characters do the inevitable or my players do the inevitable um, off the wall thing like blast a hole through the wall I don't have to worry that oh they just screwed up my lighting model um, you know I just draw a zone that represents the, the area that they blasted. We'll uh, give you an opportunity to, to walk through a couple of the, the features of Epic Table because I'll I, you know I went through to your website and walked through the uh, the quick the quick tutorial and to your credit I think you accurately describe at least what's on the website which is you know you quick you sorry you click and and, and uh, uh, you know it's a very uh, visually um, uh, straightforward um, piece uh, a user experience it looks like. Um, so, a couple more, let's see. Uh, let's see, I did get a question, actually, I believe it says, one of the people who was actually watching um, sent a, uh, a question and asked uh, about um, cross-platform support. Is this something that is straightforward to run on different platforms, or is this uh, kind of PC only, or how does it work? Yeah, so it's Windows only, um, which is a question I get all the time at, at Gen Con. Um, you know the the cheat answer is that you can run it on parallels. One of the guys in my gaming group is a Mac guy, and he runs it on parallels. Swears it runs better on parallels than it does on Windows, which I think is you know <laughs> I think sure that's whatever. a that's a Mac thing. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean it's Windows only. Is there's no no way around it. Um, but the the guys that are used to um, dealing with Windows only on Mac um, tend to to just run under parallels. Okay, is it Parallels is a specific emulator then? Yeah, Parallels is um, like a VM virtual machine okay. for for uh, the Mac. Okay. Um, so let's see. So I'm a GURPS guy, um, and I was wondering if it were possible for you to do 3D6 roll under in a fairly straightforward manner. And I want to do this in a visual way. Uh, could you walk through booting up, you know, share your screen, walk through booting up uh, the, the program, uh, and, and maybe let's, you know, we can sort of do an attack defense structure. Is that something that is quick and easy? Yeah, sure. Um, let me switch over. Yep. And I think this is what you want. Yeah, you bet. Okay. So a uh, few things about this. So if you just want a real quick... 3D6. You can just click on the D6 down here at the bottom and hit 3. And you get the 3D6. So I hit a 2 there too. <laughs> Fat fingered it. But um, you, know, you can get a quick roll that way. If you are looking for something more interesting though, there's this dice rolls tab. And we can really quickly build the dice roll. So if I want 3D6, I just hit that three times. I can name these things, you know. So, um, you know, if I want this to be yeah, kind of like attack yeah, roll or something, I can do that. I can, um, you know, do things like say that I want to re-roll ones. I can huh. just throw that in there, and let's say that I want to explode on sixes. I can do that. So, you know, with no scripting and very little effort, I can put together a role like that. Okay. Can uh, is it possible to do like you know rolling against a target, or you know, I guess in Dungeons and Dragons it would be you know roll d20 plus x greater than whatever, or it's the really it's, that's the greater than whatever is part of the rules that you don't want to code. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's the yeah. I, I don't do hit determination. Um, the closest thing to that is you know some games do success counting, so I can throw like um, I think uh, what is it a mouse guard or one of the burning wheel uh, shatter, does shatter, that. Yeah, shatter run. Lot you know, of, so, you, yeah. so you can do that kind of thing where you do success counting. It'll do the the eval of that kind of thing for you. Okay. Um, what about characters and stuff? Is that something that, uh, or is this literally, you know, that the, the character sheet is something you would put on a tabletop and therefore the game doesn't really drive to that? So I can show you what the characters 
look like today. So it's the basic info that you need within this environment. So his map size, um, the the name, the you can have a separate map token and portrait. Um, so you know behind here we've got the the portrait bar. A lot of times what I'll do in a, a role play heavy game, I'll have a sort of a face up portrait and then a, a top down map token. Okay, sure. And uh, and then you have notes here, and you can so for like you know an old school game, you might just you know throw in that kind of thing and keep track of your stats here. You know that sort of thing. That's basically and, so. It's basically a word processor. It's kind of an online version of, of a wiki in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and then you can come in here and so you know maybe I create myself a a tab for gear, you know, and a tab for stats and that kind of stuff. So you get sort of a quick, easy ability to manage your character here within the, the environment. Okay. Yeah, so you got you got your tabs, you got your and every time I talk I lose the screen. There we go. So you your, <laughs> every time I talk I'm looking at myself. Um, so uh, so you've got tabs that you can create on the fly. Can you import pictures into those tabs if you wanted to? Yeah, you can. Um, one thing I've cautioned people about, and I guess a, a feature in waiting here, is that when you do inline pictures, I, I found this out the hard way. Um, RTF, uh, rich text format, doesn't compress pictures. <laughs> so the, these end up being enormous. Um, so for, for small things, you know, like if I just want to throw in a, not that small, you know, throw in a, a little pick like that. That kind of stuff is fine. What I found was right off the bat I had someone that backed one of these tabs with a full 8.5 by 11 character sheet, which is an awesome idea. Um, it's just that blows up to an enormous size in an RTF file. So what I what I plan to do is to to strip the images out and manage them myself rather mm -hmm. than let let RTF manage them. Um, in the meantime, I went in and put some some things here to, to help you out. Like if you select a, a huge image, it'll warn you, hey, this is a huge image. This is, you know, this may be a problem for you if you have a lot of players. Um, you know, and at a certain point it will just say, you know, I really, you can't, can't pull in an image that large. It's going to wreck your game. So, so you just alluded to the player thing. So, does every play every player has to have a, a copy of this up running on their PC? They do. They do. Um, the deal is, though, they don't have to have a license. Um, so, it's uh, what what I've been calling kitchen table licensing. It's you know, if you own the table, it's yours. Other people can come over, sit down, and play. They don't have to bring their own table with them. They don't have you. Don't have to tell me who they are. You don't have to buy a certain number of of player licenses or or swap them out or anything like that. It's just you know, it it covers your whole group, so it makes things a lot easier. It avoids the the whole conversation of hey, do we all want to chip in and get a bunch of licenses? You know, or get some license pack or something. So, so really, if I purchase the the Epic Table, I download it on my computer, and I've got five players, they can all I invite them to the game somehow, or yep, yep, okay, yeah, yeah. Essentially, the uh, so can the, you invite me to this game? Like you've yeah. got a, a game running there, you could send me yeah. an email or something. Yeah, what I do is I just go out here to this this invite button and it generates a um, generates a, a passphrase that I then mail you and you know I can just there's a copy and close thing so I can just it'll copy the passphrase and then I can um, put it into the the G plus window or email it to you or whatever and then from your end you just do accept invitation paste in that phrase and from then on that's the only time that handshake is done after that it's in my list it's in your list and you don't have to bother with that 
okay, but you have to have a copy of the game, I have to have a copy of the game, and the networking, or so to speak, is just done um, by invite. Yep. Okay. Yep. Right. Yeah, that's so all of the networking in Epic Table, all the communication goes through the cloud so that there's no one is the um, you might host the game but it's host in the sense of host a party um, you're not running the server the servers are all central and that way everyone has only outbound connections and the beauty of that is you don't have firewall issues you don't have router issues that kind of stuff cool once and once you buy it do you, do you is it you know do you just download free upgrades or is there you know every you know some 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 programs are pay by the month. Some are you buy it once and you're done. Sometimes it's you know Epic Table One, Epic Table Two, and how does that uh, work for this one? So it's a you buy it, um, you own Epic Table One. Someday there'll be an Epic Table Two when I feel like there's enough new content to warrant that, and then Epic Table Two um, will be a an upgrade, you know, that existing. Owners of Epic Table One will have some sort of some sort of deal. Sure, sure. Um, so speaking of Epic Table Two, um, which gets into a couple of questions on the present and future of virtual tabletops and, and role playing online, what kind of upgrades would you say would merit a version two? What is it that you've got in your mind or in works or in the vision that says at this point this is Epic Table Two? It's cool enough that's new. Mm -hmm. It merits a, a new version. Yeah, so um, the kinds of things that I've been thinking about, this, the, the heuristic that I've been using for the line between 1 and 2 is um, things that are Epic Table 1 are things that make the, the current feature set better. Um, so, so Fog of War was something that was part of the, the initial Epic Table vision you know, for quite some time. Fog of War was had to be a 1x feature. Um, some of the things that I'm doing surrounding the... Uh, I have this feature coming up called cloud caching where I'm going to be taking some of the, the load off of the um, off of the host's machine uh, with respect to image distribution. So Epic Table, there's no... You don't pass out images ahead of time. Everything's on the fly and then it's cached. Um, but it means that especially if you're the GM, you're introducing a lot of images, sometimes big ones, and um, and everybody's hitting your machine to get those if they don't already have them, and that can be kind of a drag um, if you've got a slow connection. And so there's this, this feature coming up called cloud caching where I'll automatically take care of um, posting that up through like Amazon S3 or something um, so that you don't have that that drag on your machine for distributing those resources. That's an example of making Epic Table better, and that's that's one X kind of stuff. Um, two X features are making Epic Table different or broadening what Epic Table is. So, for instance, um, you know you saw that in Epic Table One, you've got a a way to simply manage um, characters. Epic Table Two and and dice rolls are. Um, you know, you have a very capable builder, but you have no no ability to bring in like character variables. So, Epic Table Two, one of the the things on the slate is allowing you to build dice rolls that incorporate live character data, and to manage that live character data, um, probably both through a, a a fairly general and simple Epic Table uh, character data manager, um, but also I've been talking with the guys at Hero Lab about some sort of integration there, you know, where if you're using Hero Lab anyway, then, you know, why not manage your characters there and yet have all the dice rolls and stuff appear here. Um, Would it be an impossible or an IP illegal task to say, if you have a user, user fillable character sheet, like a PDF, you can bring it in, or, you know what I mean, sort of something that you say, look, if you have something with names and spaces that associate with the names, it may not be pretty, but you can access that data. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's totally reasonable. Um, you know, the, the, one of the philosophies with Epic Table has been that 
you can use what you have. So, like for instance, if you're a Pathfinder AP subscriber, um, you know the it's it's easy to pull in your map images, your character portraits, that kind of stuff, and it's easy to get them shared with your players. Um, the you know, and naturally, you know, it's the the users need to think about what constitutes fair use and that kind of that kind of thing. Um, but but yeah, the I mean, in keeping with the the sort of ease of use kind of thing, what I would envision is, you know, maybe you pull in a a PDF of the character sheet and then just tell Epic Table where are the fields, and you know, then it it takes it from there. Right, right. Okay. Um, I want to bring up one uh, one uh, screenshot uh, from your website, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so here, I believe, uh, we have the fog of war delineation of of, of hallways and rooms. Um, can you see that? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so I guess the question that I'd ask is. Do you think, and I ask this to, I'm going to ask this to everybody, because this is the hardest part for me <laughs> in terms of time management is, let's say I have a map or a cool picture or whatever, I want to bring it in and I want to use it. Now, this box delineation that you've done here has some clear advantages in time. Do you ever think that it would be possible um, to basically say, okay, I'm pulling in an image and I'm going to ask it to find the open spaces so it does this kind of thing for you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that that's a possibility, and that, and you know to tell you the truth, that's one of the things I was looking at when I had the ray trace based approach because it was really important to tell Epic Table where are the walls, um, or at least where are not the walls, and so I had these tools for um, for doing kind of a flood fill kind of approach to to let you designate walls and things. Um, it does. It is not real trivial to do that. Um, it gets time consuming for both of us. Um, so I, I'm not sure uh, whether that's a, a route that I would go. Um, it, it's certainly worth considering. I mean, if you look at... Well, let me flip over to, to my map a second. Sure. Um, which is, interestingly, the same map that you were showing. Um yeah, so if you you know if you look at this, these are pretty clearly defined. And I had talked. This was um, done with Campaign Cartographer, and I had my booth was next to um, the Pro Fantasy guys um, that do Campaign Cartographer one year at Gen Con, and um, we had talked a bit about how how they represented walls in their world, and it's um, it was remarkably close to to my internal format for for designating walls um, back when I was doing the ray trace thing. Um, you know, so, so clearly there's some opportunity there. Um, I don't know. I, I'd, I'd have to think about what, what does that mean? Um, you know, what's the, what's the epic table thing to do <laughs> with that information? Right, right, um, right. You know, is it to automatically define the zones? Is it uh, to do something else with it? Um, it had dawned on me that... Um, you know the zones in Epic Table, and let, and let me just actually show you one of these real quick, um, since you're looking at my screen anyway. If I flip over and I enable fog, it looks like that. And um, then if I go to the fog layer, these zones are like this. Now, um, yeah, I can delete some of these just to to show you how easy they are to deal with. Um, you know, I can – let me turn this guy on. So I can – I, I can do that. that. You're just clicking? I can either right-click and select it from this menu, or I can just uh, control right-click, toggles it on and off. Um, I can resize this. All Everything – so let me get rid of some, some stuff here. I can hide the chat, hide the dice tray, and give us some more room. Um, and I can even zoom out so I can see more of the, the map. Um, so, you know, while the the characters are here talking about whether they should listen at the door, I can 
drag in a new zone and flip it on. So it's it's real quick to do, um, you know, which which makes me think twice about anything that's uh, that's real automatic. The one thing I have thought about is, uh, are you familiar with the game Tannhauser? No, I'm not. Tannhauser is a fantasy flight board game, and it has this really cool uh, mechanic or, that is for handling line of sight that really was the inspiration for Zones. They they color the board different colors, um, and if you're on the same color as someone else, then you two have line of sight and can shoot each other. And there are overlapping things. So, like, if I go down here and I grab this, notice it stops at the door. Well, if it didn't, if it came all the way up here, um, then you've got this notion of if this guy's standing here... Um, he can see everything in that box. He should be able to see everything in this box, but also everything in this box and everything in this box. Gotcha. And and that's once you start to think about it as these zones as potentially line of sight zones, then it's not a stretch to say, well, and what if we wanted to limit his ability to see by the radius of the light source that he's carrying with him, you know? And then all of a sudden it becomes a there's another level of complexity here. Um, but that would just be a I, zone that moved with the token. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and and suddenly you have uh, you have lighting added to this model in a way that is very in keeping with the the rest of the sort of simple no prep philosophy, and yet I think would work pretty well, um, you know. So that's that's another thing I'm going to right. be. And honestly, what, what I would what I would look at doing in terms of, you know in my copious software experience, but what I would look at doing. Because I really do like the, the the zone model that you have there. Is if I brought in a map, what I would probably ask to do is to see what rectangles, ovals, or certain size shapes would say. Okay, first I'm going to look all over for rectangles, mm -hmm. and then you set these up, and then I'll look all over for pattern matching of ovals. And right. So this so this one in the center here would turn into an oval. Everything else would have squares, and then it would say, you know, basically maybe it would even say. Okay, I'm going to highlight everywhere where two zones intersect, and I'm going to ask you if there's a door or a space at each one. And then you say yes, yes, no, yeah. You do a Boolean thing, and then mm -hmm. boom, boom, instant map from an Epic Tables perspective. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and I like that um, that sort of machine augmented human <laughs> approach, you know, where you're not you're not trying to make the machine autonomous. You know, and make it perfect in your, but you're just trying to take some of the load off the human. Exactly right. So instead of instead of putting every box in, making me do every box, there's some obvious box-like shapes. I'm not going to try and find the table and the um, uh, the shield and the items and say, oh, do you think that this is a small dagger? No, right. I just want the big outlines. <laughs> you know. Uh, Maybe what you can do is if you're bringing in something from, for example, uh, fractal terrains, like if a, a hex crawl map, maybe it'll do that one. Actually, you can probably do by color, uh, but you know that's the kind of thing. It's like you have a campaign cartographer, you have uh, fractal terrains, you can import in a certain format. You're not going to say, okay, anything that fractal terrains can do, I can handle. But if you export it in this way. I can help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think that that kind of stuff is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so, and that sounds like version two. <laughs> Maybe version yeah. three. Yeah. I mean, so so certainly there's so other things that um, that to me. So there's the the Hero Lab integration. I want to look at. I want to look at some sort of conflict management. Um, and I say conflict management instead of initiative tracker <laughs> because I, because a lot of the games that I play initiative isn't really a thing um, so like for instance if you're playing primetime adventures right, right you don't right. really have you know it's that's not a thing right but but you still have this notion of um, of wanting to wanting to designate who's in the conflict who's not what side are they on and um, you know so I've been thinking about conflict from a, a 
a general uh, uh, perspective, and how do you how do you let somebody um, you know because so Epic Table's not just maps. You have tabletops too. So how do you let someone throw up a tabletop and designate it as a sort of an encounter workspace and and visually move stuff around to say okay these guys are in this faction these guys are in that faction um, deal cards out onto the table. Epic Table sure, doesn't support sure. cards yet, but that's that's certainly a a two uh, a two o thing. Um, you know so. You know, and that would be interesting because then you could almost say, hey, I'm going to structure out a cut. And this is something that the game master of a game that I played in only briefly because I had sound problems and I couldn't get my sound to work with Hangouts and uh, we were using, maybe we were using Roll20. I can't actually remember. Um, but I, I was having a problem. As it turns out, it's a conflict between Skype, Hangouts, and multiple windows of having, like if I have Roll20 in one and a hang out in the, in the other, uh, my, my, my computer just freaks out. Um, so that was a problem, and I wound up having to pl not play. But what he would do is he would have this cool structured social conflict thing that was almost like, you know, you've got the king who has these goals, and you've got this faction who has these goals. It was almost like a mind map, if you're familiar with those. Yeah, yeah. And you could move people along the mind map, and that's right. a conflict space that has almost nothing to do with dice. It doesn't have to do with armor class. It definitely had something to do with GURPS reaction roles uh, and the social engineering um, product by, by William Stoddard. Uh, but it, it's not hit, defend, parry, damage, grapple, throw, bite, whatever. It, it was very much, oh, I had jazz hands going on there. I have to stop that. <laughs> um, but there was very much a different kind of thing that facilitated a role-playing discussion. Right, right, right. And that's, so the... Uh... Um, you know, if I show for a second the the epic table, just tabletop. So here's a, a tabletop, and the kind of thing that I'm that I've been thinking is you, know, you can do things like drag uh, index cards around on here, and um, so I've got a, a an example where I do a fiasco setup um, with index cards and dice and things like that. Um, you know, so I'm thinking a, a conflict manager that's based around this kind of sure. um, this kind of thing. And then if I uh, pop the dice tray back in here a second, um, you know, you can throw dice on the tabletop as well and roll them here. So for games like Dogs in the Vineyard, um, where it does have a, a tabletop mechanic for conflict resolution, um, where you're you're bidding essentially, and you know, pushing dice forward against your your opponent and and that kind of thing. Um, you know, think you add cards to this and and you give the the GM a an ability to set up a a pretty interesting conflict area and a way to manage conflict for a lot of different kinds of games. Um, you know, that said, I get asked every single year at Gen Con about uh, initiative trackers. And so, yeah, I mean, I think part of the – part of once Hero Lab, Lab or whatever whatever sort of live character data solution is part of 2.0, I think, you know, there has to be uh, an initiative tracker at that point. There's just – there's too many people interested in it. Um, but while I'm thinking of that, you know, I want to be thinking about it in more general terms because I think that this – the ability to, to handle different games is really important to me personally because I play – a lot of different kinds of games, um, but I also think it helps for things like, um, you know, the Hero System folks visit me every year at Gen Con, and you know their their initiative is different, right? They don't they they may appear at several places in initiative. It's not just you know is my guy at at you know see first or third. It's like he might be first and third. And so the ability to to have some more general space where you can um, where you can manage the conflict in a way that's n that doesn't presume that everything's happening in a grid, I think right, is important. right, right, right. No, and that's uh, that that's neat. You know, one of the things that uh, that GURPS 
does do right now is there's an advantage called altered time rate, which allows you to take multiple maneuvers on your turn. And a maneuver is sort of a one-second action declaration. What it doesn't do is space those maneuvers out. Mm. Because that's not you, – you, you, you go in descending order of basic speed, fastest to slowest, and, you know, if you have altered time rate – then you on when it's your turn you go twice and you can do some pretty cool things. But what you don't do is go at your basic speed slot at seven and three and a half, where you take a turn and then you can do it again at three and a half, which is what Hero does. Yeah, uh, yeah. Or at least that's what it did when I played. Um, it's gone through a f- couple editions since <laughs> 1988, um, or whatever. Um, so, so no, that's that's pretty neat. Um, let me ask a couple questions, and then I'll I'll give you the floor to for for the famous parting shot. I always give my guests the last word so that they can uh, close on whatever the topic of their choice. Uh, what do you think the importance, if any, of video? Because obviously we're talking on video, and and social gaming is a social medium, and I think that the face to face interaction, even if it's digitally face to face, is important. Is that something that uh, you're thinking about, or is that you know, run hangouts offline? Yeah, I I think for for me, at least for the foreseeable future, it's always going to be run Hangout or uh, or run Skype. Um, I don't don't want to try to compete with those. First of all, those are you know pretty established environments. And in my games, you know we've been using both, where we'll have Google Hangouts um, or Skype, and then we'll also have Epic Table. Um, and and the interesting thing that I found is that it really depends a lot on the group as to how much time they spend with video versus how much time they spend with the tabletop. Um, and the the one game that I was in where we were using video a lot and we were using Epic Table a lot, it was kind of nice because, uh, you know, I'm in another game where we were using Hangout and we weren't using Epic Table. And... When you have this ability to, to do drawings and stuff like that in Hangout, um, but when you do, the video's gone. You right. know, or or you know, just like when I was flipping to screen share, you know, my video was gone. And I really like having them both there where, you know, the, the video's kinda omnipresent and then you have your tabletop surface that's separate. And you know, so far I, I'm not seeing a problem with that model except for it would be really nice, I think, for some of the G plus folks to not have to install a separate thing. Right. You know, right, I think right. I think even though that separate thing sort of ultimately has some advantage advantages, I think it's that initial hurdle of oh gee, there's a separate thing that I have to install. Um, you know, can sometimes be a, a stopping point for somebody. Which begs the question: Is do you ever foresee a time where you're gonna ask Google to integrate Epic Table as, a, as an app. I mean, I can do that with Roll20, right? I can just go to the left side of my window, click on it, and boom, here's Epic Table and Hangouts. Um, is that something that, I'm sorry, Roll20 and Hangouts. Is that something that, that do they That's, have the exclusivity there, or is that something that uh, you no, can do? No, they don't. Um, it's something that I've been looking at uh, and experimenting with different ways of bringing Epic Table functionality into to Google+. Plus. Right. Right, and the next question is: Is do, do you ever do you ever foresee sort of, or maybe it's already there, multiple window or multiple monitor support to sort of avoid that problem? So you have your index cards on and your dice pools on the right hand monitor, and your map and characters on the left, or multiple windows or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. So um, it it's actually it was supposed to be in one dot two fell out uh, to to basically get. Fog of War out Something there, out there. Sure. Uh, yeah. but it but in 1.3, um, which is sitting on my machine upstairs, you can drag these tabs off of the the sheet and drag them to another monitor, which is great for the guys that use it for face to face games. Yes, yes, where, yes. You know where they just they want the the player view um, off on the big monitor and keep their GM view back here on the their own laptop or whatever. And that's a, that's a great segue into what's going to wind up being the last couple of questions, I think. So you've got online gaming. You know, we're playing online, and I'm playing with someone from Australia and Hong Kong and Minneapolis and those crazy guys in New York City, whatever. But I've also you've also got facilitated face-to-face gaming. Right. Um, and it sounds like, you know, the Epic Table is, is useful for both. 
Yeah, there's actually a, a couple Epic Table customers, at least, who use it exclusively for face-to-face -face games, um, where they, you know, they have a one has a projector-based setup, and you know, another has a big screen, and um, they run it that way. Right now, because you can't tear these tabs off, uh, what they're doing is they run a separate instance. They run, you know one instance for the that is just basically the headless player and another instance that's their GM box. But yeah, it's a it's a it's a nice way to to basically share handouts especially. I used to always print out handouts on an inkjet and bring them so I could throw them out on the table and say, ha ha, this is the thing you see. Um, it's really nice not to have to do that <laughs> the night before the game um, and instead just have the, the images sitting there in a directory and throw them up as handouts or throw them on the uh, on the, the tabletop. Sure. So sort of last thing and then a parting shot for you is, so what's the, uh, what's the future of virtual tabletops, tabletop role-playing, What's, you know, project five, ten years into the future and tell me what you see. Wow. Um, you know, I think that increasingly there... I think that the, the notion of being able to play when you're not necessarily face-to-face -face is, is going to be a durable one. Um, you know, it's, it's almost the only way I play anymore. And it's not that I don't like to play face to face. It's just finding the time is really difficult. And um, you know, so even with some people that are local to me, I end up playing online um, more than I do face to face. But um, but especially as I've gotten into the indie game community, um, there are a lot of games that I wouldn't. I I just don't have anyone around here to play with. Um, so online gaming I, has been really important. I think will continue to be um, really important. I think the the augmented reality kind of stuff or the augmented physical gaming I think will continue to be important. What I what I do think will change um, over the next five years is that there will be a lot more um, a lot more variability in terms of devices. Um, you know I think the the big big LED displays are getting cheaper and so you'll see more people that can afford to have a, um, you know, a game on a big screen or even lay a big screen down on a tabletop. A true and, virtual tabletop. Yeah, and do that. I think there's going to be a lot more hybrid games where you might have the big screen, but then you have your character sheet in a tablet. Right. Um, you know, and I think that's going to be a challenge for for me with Epic Table because it is Windows based. You know, I've been looking at, you know, what is the what's the the future for Epic Table, given that I believe that the future is lots of different kinds of devices, and and the game isn't on one PC, but it's spread out across a number of devices, different parts of the game running on different devices. Right. Um, you know, what does that mean? I, you know, does it mean that it's all HTML5 and JavaScript? Um, you know, I kind of hope not because I'm not that guy today, and so there's a lot of uh, a lot of ramp up for me to 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 pull it put it into that kind of environment. Um, but that you know that's the I think that's a possibility. There's also um, you know I've been looking at the Windows Surface devices. I've been looking at the Windows 8 devices that are not Microsoft um, that are actually in a lot of cases pretty nice. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I I'm not sure that I'm not sure the future is Microsoft, but I'm sure that the future is heterogeneous devices, um, right? And you know, and some online component. Yeah, you kind of have this thing. This is a metronome, not a phone, but you kind of have this thing where it's like you know, you bring up your little dice thing and you shake it and you throw it at the screen, and it's like three six-sided dice roll across the screen because it knows where you are, and so you get yeah, a little bit cool. of a kinematic thing going on. Um, okay, so I want to thank you for your time, but I also want to give you the sort of the last word. So, um, what do you uh, what do you want to leave uh, anyone who watches this with? Um, wow, I, I you know I think um, I think mainly if if there's one thing, it would be that if you haven't tried online gaming, um, you know, find a way to there. The what I found I was. 
and in particular the the indie game community I think there's a lot of really really interesting stuff going on there and it's a it's a very inclusive community a um, lot of very cool people um, it, it can be kind of intimidating um, you know I think to to think about going out and getting involved in games that you're not familiar with, um, people you're not familiar with, um, but it's it's really a worthwhile thing. I think that the the one thing that the online gaming um, really opens up is you know so certainly you know use it to get your game back together and you know and game again if you haven't been gaming because of geography, but also you know think about some of these games that that maybe you're your group at home doesn't play and you know there are people out there that that do play them and and there's a lot of cool stuff out there to try that that really virtual tabletops open up a, a great avenue for for broadening your gaming experience all right well uh, thank you for your time and I'm glad you uh, came on board the firing squad for uh, the March uh, blog carnival yeah thanks for having me it was a lot of fun absolutely